you all over Facebook, you're famous. <laughs>
Yes. Hello. Um, hello, and welcome to A Movable Beast. This is uh, the first one, of, or the last one of this season before we go on break. Um, we have the next one is on January 20th. Um, and I'm so glad to have you all here tonight. It's kind of a lighter night, I think, attendance-wise. So. Um, so, real quick, next time on January 20th, we're going to have two films to show, one directed by Desiree Nicole Barrett and another by Zoe Lambert. We also have Mike Stark from uh, the Up, uh, Up Rabbit Mountain Band. The Up Rabbit Mountain Band, nice, yeah. awesome, and Eric and I don't know Marcy. Marcy McReynolds. Ma Marcy McReynolds will be here um, doing something, and so that'll be really cool. So big thanks to Steve I and Solar Culture for letting us use their space. And we have a, a GoFundMe to support the series. We're still looking to get the second half uh, to pay the rent. So if you can uh, give a little bit, just put it in the jar, or you can go online and check out our website at sonorousinkright.com and you can get to the GoFundMe from there. Uh, and so also, just for all the poets and writers out there, Sonorous Anchor at the press I'm starting, uh, is reading, reading period is opening up on January 1st. So if you'd like to submit something, so maybe we'll get it published, uh, let us know. Check them out. And Lisa, uh, where's Lisa? There's Lisa. Um, her so, her uh, Sabino Canyon Writers Group is tomorrow. And are you still looking for people for that? Yes. Sure. So, 8 o'clock, Sabino Canyon. Email Lisa or talk to Lisa and you can get, get some information with that. Um, and there's a lot of poetry stuff going on in Tucson. Mm -hmm. Revolutionary Grounds Open Mic is happening the first Friday of the month at 5 p.m. at Revolutionary Grounds Coffee House. Spark Collective has a po poetry night the second Saturday of the month at 6 p.m. And Splinter Collective is interrupted by trains the next one's on November 26th at 8 p.m. Also, the POG reading series is in swing. Uh, Tony Luberman and Karen Brennan are on November 20th at 6 at the Steinfeld. And no, not at the Steinfeld. Not at the Steinfeld? Right. It's on the website, the POG website. Don't listen to the POG website, I guess. Where is or, or ask me. It's it's a Tim Fuller's Photo Studio, 135 South Sixth Avenue, in the backside of the new Delta restaurant there. Okay, and so and the Tracy Morris one also at Tim Fuller's Studio. No, that's at Steinfeld. <laughs> okay, and that one's at the Steinfeld. So I'm sure uh, PogArtsTucson.org will. I don't know, but let we'll figure that out. I've talked to Charles or uh, to get details on that. All right, and so we're gonna get started. Um, Charles, would you like to come up and talk about checks for a minute? Okay. I'm in the not as tall as David Brigade. <laughs> so David asked me to come tonight for two purposes. Uh, one was to read poetry, which I guess I'll do a little later and the other is to talk about uh, the press that I started here in 1984. And so that's what I'm doing now. If you wandered by the table, one of the tables full of books, including unfolding books with art and uh, print in them, you may have gathered that we do a lot of kinds of books at Jack's Press. Um, I was a bookmaker before I came to Tucson. I, continue that practice here and also after about five years here in the late 1980s started publishing books more recognizable as trade paperback editions of poetry and so all of the kinds of bookmaking continue and it's primarily poetry that we've published for uh, all of these years something like 250 books altogether and uh, but a little bit of fiction 
uh, a little bit of drama, a little bit of essays and otherwise. Our most recent, actually, couple of books are the selected poems of Rachel Bly du Plessis uh, and the selected letters of two uh, important uh, poets, uh, California poets, although one started out in New York, Barbara Guest and Stephen Ratcliffe. And I think we have, while, while our uh, male shoots are always open to new possibilities for projects, uh, we also have something like 20 books lined up to be published in the next couple of years. So uh, it's a busy, busy time. And what else would I say about Shaq's Press? You know, we like to think that the book is not defined, that there's an openness about what it might be, what it might become, you know, following on, uh, you know, Ezra Pound's a book should be a ball of light in one's hands, but also sort of notions about the book as uh, spiritual instruments, as uh, something to be made from the inside out, i.e., uh, when we find a work we want to become a book, I hope that what we do in design and in structure and in making has a relationship with what the material within is. And that's kind of what keeps us going and keeps us interested in doing that work. And it's so we've been in, we've been in many places though. I, I think of us as being in Tucson forever, but in fact, uh, after that beginning here, and we uh, had a few years in Minneapolis when we were away, and a few years in Texas when we were away. So, but I think, I think this is the last stop. <laughs> and, uh, and it is the place we've had more time than anywhere else. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization, and we're, uh, collaborative organization in many ways. We uh, helped start uh, POG in that reading series and remain involved with that. And even before that, and from the late 80s to mid 90s, we had a reading series here in Tucson called Here and Now, and a series of talks and sometimes readings by artists called the Magritte Sessions, if anybody has been around here long enough to remember the Cafe Magritte on Congress Street uh, when Congress Street was a little bit of a wilder place than it is now. <laughs> and, and an absolutely wonderful place. Uh, principals at Chax Press include uh, Cynthia Miller, the visual artist who is my life partner too, and I couldn't do it without her. She's here tonight and uh, many other people over the years, including recently uh, David Weiss, who's uh, doing this movable beast and another press now. So we kind of thread through a lot of things in this town. And I think I'll call it stop to this now and let other people do poetry and I will do some of that later. Thank you. So. I decided since there was a focus on presses tonight, though, I brought poems that I was writing about a year ago that have to do with parts of the book and seeing those parts, seeing through them to other things as well. And the first part of that, it's a book length manuscript, and the first part of it has to do with paper, particularly handmade paper and certain aspects of sheets of paper. It's called Mold Deckel Mark, to see through the paper, to want to see through the words on the paper. Paper made of, made with water. Water pushes fiber through fiber. We are fibered in the words of a mouth, a muthos, and mouths too require water and give water. The fibers and water bond, become a pulp, become a place of suspension on wires one direction, wires another direction, 
laid wires, laid lines, wove wires, wove lines, translucent water obscured with fibers, or remains translucent in a corner, or anywhere light transmutes through, or another wire sewn into wire, twisted in place, so that lesser fiber, lesser pulp adheres, more light finds its way through, watermark, we call it, as though a noun, a thing. Love, resist, imagine, a line on a bookmark. Love, devotion, and surrender. The music of a Coltrane through the music of guitars, the lines through the light on paper lines, which are laid lines, logos lines, devotional lines, history lines, lithic lines, stone lines. These pages out of orders, so a turn of a page, maybe a turn of two or three or four pages, and a return beckons a future, folds through a past, a word interrupts what it never knew to interrupt. The descent beckons as the ascent beckons. If we place the watermark where a word places itself, where a mouth speaks a logos, might we see through that word to another logos, another space, another watermark? A microlensing, Dimitri said on the mountain, when through a lens, a star, we see more stars, more distant stars. And through lives, might we see other lives, those dreams, those black, Lives matter with light, with water, with tune, with attunement, love supreme. I want to see through words. I wants, and I wants, and eyes want, and eyes want water. No drying, no dying, no shooting in streets, but shooting water upon the track of the beater, beating, forcing water through fiber, into paper, dried on racks until one can lift a sheet and hold it by a corner and crack it with a whipping motion to hear a crack, a sound of paper and history of water and fiber. This is a story of words on paper, out of mouth, out of water. A mark, a mark, mark through marks, mark time, mark territory, mark among marks. But water mark is a verb, a process. Water marks the frame, water marks the sheet of paper formed, and we see through fiber, see through paper, see light through shape. To see the rough words is to see light through words, to see words a mouth sees, speaks words through water, Mutho logos, words about other words, stories about other stories, a palimpsest, a watermark, a verb. Seeing through the watermark, the Buddha of light, or the light of Buddha, or just love, a light seen through all light. At the edge of paper, as the slurry on the form settles, a deco forms, a soft edge, a light around the corner. Raise the mold up parallel to your body. Dip the form into the vat of slurry, fiber soaked and chemically bonded together through the work of water. With your arms stretched out, bring the mold through the slurry, turning its face up so the pulp coheres onto the face of the mold. Then raise straight up, hold, shake slightly while holding a tension in your arms. Raise, dip, turn, raise, hold, shake the words, the mythologos in the light. Now we have the water, the mark, the page, the word, the light. I want to see through the word. I want to see the history of the word. I want to see the future of the word. I want to see the weight of the word. Now the light, now the way. Thank you.
Thank you, Charles. And I just wanted to say that, uh, um, unfortunately, the other presses tonight couldn't be here. Um, um, Amanda Meeks from Outlandish and Bookish was going to come, and but she's not feeling well tonight. So, um, hopefully, in the future, she can come and we can get uh, get to see some of the zines she makes, which are really cool. Um, so, uh, Mary Beth, would you like to read? Oh. Actually, it's just kind of a surprise that I was coming here tonight. I didn't know. Oh, well, thank you. And, uh, so, but then when I saw I could, that it was an open mic, I thought, well, I haven't done one of these, so why not? I do write, I do write a lot of poetry. Um, so then I was searching on my phone for something I could read. Um, I'll read a couple short ones at first. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, this one is not titled, but I said it originally to like a, a piece of art, um, not that I do though. If stars compel our fate, as time and light relate, therein lies the flaw in fate. Starlight travels far too slow. By the time you know to string the bow, the moment has passed. And then this next one, is a tribute to um, a story called Nine Billion Names of God by Arthur C. Clarke. And I was very um, profoundly inspired by this story when I was a kid. Um, so the nine billionth note. On the nine billionth note, all stars fade out. On the nine billionth note, all strings snap silent. All chords played out. Every story every told, ever told, every spirit ever named, every song, ever sung, no notes remain, not even a refrain. On the nine billionth note, all stars like candles flicker out, breath by breath, the last exhale. Um, so a few years ago, a friend of mine named Lockie Scores, who was a longtime musician in town, he just died this past April, um, a few years ago, he found out that I had been a creative writing major, and he was like, do you write songs? And I'm like, no, I write bad poetry. <laughs> and then we started talking, and, and so I started writing some songs for him. It, it never really went too far, but like, he would send me a song, and then I would write like a song, uh, uh, some lyrics to it. Um, and so I'm, I'm, this was really meant to be sung. He did sing it for uh, on a couple occasions, um, but I can't sing, and I don't have him here to play. But in tribute to him, I'm going to read this one. Um, I he had sent me this melody, and I thought about how much he and his life, he and his wife loved each other and were so devoted to each other, and so I wrote it inspired by them, uh, his wife Tony. Uh, the song is called Whole Heart. I long to tell you all the ways you stole my heart. With your starlit sway, you waltz my heart away. It's a rhythm only we know after trials and tears so soft and sweet, tender and slow, you stole my heart. And when your hips swing so easily between the rhyme, your heart beats in time, it beats with mine. Many moons ago, one rodeo, you roped my heart with silk and lace, tied with a kiss, you stole my heart, and beat by beat you danced with me. In faith and hope, you believed in me with your whole heart. And though the trail got steep and the wind blew fierce, through moonless dips and endless twists, you held on tight with your whole heart. I long to tell you all the ways you stole my heart. With your starlit sway, you waltzed my heart away. It's a rhythm only we know. After trials and tears, so soft and sweet, tender and slow, you stole my heart. Thank you, everyone. Cool. Well, thank you, Mary Beth. Um, and Oliver, are you good to go next? Cool. Hello, everybody. My printer is broken. So I'm going to read off this computer. 
Um, I'm just going to read a, a few works in progress. Um, something I'm working on. It's group of poems, different characters. So here are a few of them. That's nice to see you. I don't know many of you, so uh, good to meet you. My name's Oliver. Um, well, I also didn't bring my glasses, so I have to make things bigger. Okay. Um, I washed up on the shore of my 50s after several decades adrift, lost on narcotic seas, mesmerized by the luminescence of Morpheus, lulled into denial by the lap and sway on the hull, the echo of a dream long dead, retrograde, day dissolved into night, sublimated, crucified by an endless thirst, cracked lips, of heart, open to the rain, hair limp, matted, beatific, annihilated by eternity, daily liberated by despair, full of hope, hope that the awesome current would find me between the winds, languid, memorizing the same star each night, forgetting all visions, Ascetic, holy, disturbed, tired, so tired of the sea, whose shore I'd stood upon and gazed out at, the poems glittering like fool's gold on her surface, the rock and roll of waves crashing round my feet, bare and wild, calling me with siren song. And I went out and I came to know it all too well, and was spit out, unworthy of the depth, spit out like Job without a prophecy, the hair in my beard white, the lines around my eyes like cracks in the shell of soul, only to find the place I'd washed up deserted, nowhere insignificant, and the wisdom of the ordeal, which is no consequence to the yawn of time. This is called Movie Night. Turn the lights out, turn the corners down, turn the bed into the cinema. All the dogs at our feet sleep like popcorn. First you see the city, then reverse. You react like the sky. A reverse angel, it's hard to tell which is more perverse, the island covered with buildings or the sky that is always never the same. Before there was drone, there was wind, and before wind, all that was not land or sea, and before land or sea, a giant crane holding a camera in its beak, still, still as an arrow in its quiver, all the negatives have your name written in white wax. Not your name, sorry. Little moons that represent you. The way you wish to be seen. That was a long time ago, before we fell asleep, before we turned the corner. We didn't finish what we started. There you go again, dreaming for the lens. Look at it, how beautiful the glass that covers the mechanism. You turn me a few stops short of wide open, still, 
Still the light pours in and forgets everything we tried to make. Thank you. tonight I'm sharing some poems that I've been working on for a while and I'm going to be working on for a while more. Um, I collected there under the, the title of Medium. I've been working on a collection that's uh, I guess poems, monologues, um, telling the stories, exploring the voices of um, women from different periods of history that have served as mediums in various ways spiritual mediums, material, biological, and um, so I'll share a couple of these with you tonight, and uh, a lot of them, you know, in, in, in thinking about these poems and, and, and writing them, I've been thinking a lot about like, the concrete, some concrete elements and uh, more abstract elements of art and um, poetry and the relationship between poetry and performance. So I'm going to share, I'm going to start with a, um, a poem that uh, is for, is through uh, the voice of Franca Rama, a performer. Um, and the other thing I should tell you about these poems is that there's two parts. There's the poem, the voice, and then there's the vida. I'm thinking of them as vidas in the sort of um, old medieval um, troubadour sense where, you know, you have the life of the poet, the biography in a way, and then that sort of goes into or um, sets the scene um, for, for the poem. And uh, I'm really struggling with how to present um, them together and even how to, you know, how to read them, how to present them on the page eventually. Um, so if you have any ideas afterwards, we can talk about it. Um, so I think what I'm going to do tonight is going to read you the Vita and then go into the poem. Um, so Franco Rama born in 1929, died in 2013, was an Italian actress and playwright who, born into a theatrical family that could trace their roots back to Commedia dell'arte days, made her first appearance on stage at the age of only eight weeks old. Together with her husband, who may be more familiar to folks, Dario Fo, Rama wrote and starred in countless productions that performed to sold out audiences in union halls and sports stadiums, sought to entertain, raise awareness about political and social issues, and foster a sense of solidarity among the political left. When in 1997, Faux accepted the Nobel Prize for Literature, he accepted it on behalf of himself and his wife, who he emphasized was an inextricable and elemental force within everything he wrote. I am lit up. What luck to find myself like this, lit up a single speck at the end of a long and narrow beam extending through perfect darkness. What luck to be at least briefly illuminated here, a moat of dust, a coagulate, caught, lit up. What luck to find myself in the end to be that end to find myself to be a particular body, a mouth, a way of opening, to bite down on hard sentences, uh, no, hard silences, and find that they exist, that there really is something out there to sink one's teeth into, to reach out and begin to see, even in perfect darkness, the becoming of teeth and lips, the glare of eyeglasses, to begin to hear in silence the becoming of a laugh, a shout, to reach out and to grasp even in the emptiest spaces the becoming of something to be slapped with, held by, 
seized with, caressed. It has to be this way. You have to invent absolutely everything. You have to dream it all up, make it real. You have to let your hand hit on something when it reaches out. You have to give your words something to catch against. So I'm gonna um, make a leap backwards in time and read a poem now inspired by someone and uh, someone's situation that probably feels a lot closer to home to all of us than it did several years ago. And that is um, Mary Malone born 1869, died 1938, better known to most of us as Typhoid Mary. She was born in Ireland and immigrated to the United States at the age of 15, where she began working as a cook in and around New York City. Oh, here comes my favorite part. <laughs> um, I'll keep going till I can't anymore. Well, when typhoid broke out among members, broke out among members of the well-to-do families that employed her, it became evident that Mary Milan was a carrier of the disease without actually exhibiting any symptoms. The finding was unprecedented and marked a turning point for researchers and immunologists who tested Mary Milan extensively during her subsequent quarantine. Typhoid Mary soon became a well-known figure who elicited much public sympathy, especially after her cause was taken up by newspaper mogul William Randolph Hearst. She was released from quarantine under the condition that she never work as a cook again, but the condition wasn't kept. More deaths were soon linked to Typhoid Mary and her signature, signature dish, peach malba, because the dish is uncooked, it easily transmitted bacteria. After this, Mary Milan lost all public sympathy. She was quarantined in North Brother Island, a small island in New, York, New York's East River, and remained there until she died. This is called Don't Touch Me. Don't touch me. Don't ask me to explain. Look, I'm an honest woman. I'm healthy, strong, and every penny I have I've earned, don't touch me. I come recommended. Don't ask me to explain. It kills them every day in the slums. Did you know that? The Lord spoke. He said, I will send the pestilence among you but he didn't say how, and he said nothing of exempting the residents of Fifth Avenue or of Oyster Bay. Don't touch me. It kills them every day in the slums, but I am not one of them. I am healthy, hardworking, clean. I come recommended. Don't touch me. Whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be. We used to go down to the garden used to watch the souls of dead folk hop about like rabbits at the end of the lawn. They were amongst us. We did not think we were too high and mighty then. And when they knocked on the door, we opened it. And we were not surprised to see only darkness there. We were afraid, yes, sore afraid, but we did not think we should be otherwise. And if anyone died, we raced to place the hands of the dead on our skin because we were innocent. Because we were innocent and alive and God-fearing. Because we prayed mightily using simple words and never once questioned why our prayers went continually unanswered, which they did. Don't touch me. It's a simple recipe. And good. I am no murderess. I am a healthy, honest Christian woman. I trust a God to forgive the best. You cut the peaches in half. Remove the stones. You boil them in syrup and let it cool. Don't touch me. It kills them every day in the slums. I am no murderess. Never been laid up. Not even one single day in my life. I'm healthy, clean, and come well recommended. Don't touch me. I told you, I know how to handle a knife. A dreadful loneliness slips in. 
and slides its hand under my skirt, rubs its cold fingers down my spine, jabs them between my ribs, down my throat, inside my ears. Don't touch me. If there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, it is not mine. Don't ask me to explain. It's simple. Only give the fruit some time to cool. I am no murderess. There is no word you could invent, no instrument so fine or far-sighted. Don't touch me, it seeps in. Don't ask me to explain why death pursues me like any other living thing. It is not me you fear. It's the knock on the door, the magpies mad chattering at the window pane. Don't touch me. I am not that invisible thing. I stand before you, an honest Christian woman, if there be pestilence, I pray mightily, use simple words, and know not to question why my prayers go continuously unanswered, which they do. And I'll just close them. Um, <clears throat> I'll just close with um, a poem um, from another another woman um, who may be more familiar um, to you all, who's a uh, Name is Annie Easley, 1933 to 2011, and she was a computer programmer, mathematician, and they made a big movie of her uh, life a few years ago, um, and uh, a rocket scientist. She began her career as a human computer, that was actually the, the term, and uh, by, perf by performing computations for researchers in longhand. Despite the discrimination she faced as one of the only four African-American employees at the, her first lab, she remained committed to her chosen career. She developed code used in researching alternative power and energy conversion systems and just contributed to NASA's Centaur rocket program, which laid the foundation for the Apollo moon landings. So this one is called, um, We Were Computers Officially. We were computers officially before there were machines. Then, when the machines came, we were technicians. When the men came, we were ladies, girls. On weekends, we drove down to the Cape to watch the Delta rockets and the Centaurs fly. We bought peanuts and popcorn. There was always a crowd. Later, I read about the real centaurs, the ones we named the rocket for, about how they got stuck between two worlds and were often angry because of it. They didn't seem to belong. A lot of people don't know this, but there were female centaurs too. I saw a picture of them once. Two female centaurs, one of them with her face rubbed out. That's just history, I thought looking at the rubbed out space where her face should have been. Winter, I'd go out with a ski club, glide down the slopes, pretend I was flying or coming in for a landing on the surface of the moon. I'd look at all the little stunted trees covered with snow and squint my eyes so I wouldn't recognize the familiar shapes of houses or buildings or roads. I'd sail right past them watch the lights blink on at the lodge and in town and think of them like little stars. You have to see things like that from a distance, the way a computer does, a machine. You have to trust that the answers are still coming, that you can't see how they're being worked out, that the problems have all been broken up into little bits and become invisible somehow, or at least temporarily unseen. Thanks so much again for inviting me. Thank you, John. And uh, David, do you have something? Awesome. Good evening, everyone. I just have one poem today. Um, recently, uh, wrote a Sestina for the first time, and I was pleased with how it turned out. So I'm gonna share that with you now. 
<clears throat> this sestina is called Vacation. Have you ever defeathered a fat bird or struck the river life's silent jello from an old faced trout? No? Never bothered to murder a TV dinner? Atlantis awaits you for a small, small fee. In a chasm all alone, but for the defeathered flames of anglerfish, dinner is served against its will. Struck standing? Sit! A pamphlet. No pressure at these depths. Time like jello for the timeless connoisseur. Life's jello will never be wasted on you, small Atlas. No, I think no is not the answer we seek. Defeathered by daily weather, we yearn to be struck into the clouds for a quiet dinner with our true self for whom dinner is but an hors d'oeuvre to the jello in Leviathan's bones. I'm struck by your silence, friend. In the small of your heart, is there not a defeathered pain that says only no? Why not scale your pain and swim? No more terrestrial dinner no more industrially defeathered squawks or yellow jello in plastic cups. For a small fee and a small while, let your dreams forever be struck open by the possibility of Atlantis. Struck down for a hubris that's been pressed no more than 12,000 years into a small opportunity. The Atlanteans sing at dinner in the Oricalcum halls, sealed with benthic jello against the depths, a song of hope defeathered as it flew. Be not defeathered, be not struck dumb back into jello life, but say no by saying yes. One's dinner should not be small. Thank you. And now we have Purple Creature.
time performing in front of anyone, so I appreciate you guys. taking next month off, so please come back on January 20th. Look forward to seeing you all then. Take care.